We'll get started. Um, I'm delighted. I'm really happy that, that Fosco and Mario Bruna, Bruna is here in, at the GSD, because in many ways, I feel they're already part of this extended family, especially with the people who are coming here. I met them about four years ago when we were working on the Lisbon Triennale, the form of form exhibition that was curated by Andre Severish and Diego Sessions Lopes. And, uh, and that, in that exhibition, there was a pavilion where three architects came together and did an exquisite corpse of a design. So it was my office, it was Kirsten Gears and David Van Severin who teaches here, and it was Nuno Brandau. And then uh, Mario Bruna and then Fosco did the, uh, in, did the installation and the curation of the show inside. And then currently, they're doing an exhibition, The Inner Form, by the way, this is the catalog of the form of form, the one from three years ago from Lisbon Triennale. And then this is the show, the, a catalog for the, of the inner space that is in the current Lisbon Triennale. There was uh, artistic director, Eric Lapierre, who teaches here too. So in many ways, we're familiar with you and, and, and welcome. Huh? Um, uh, Fosco and Maria Brunner uh, are architects, they're designers, they're curators, writers, editors. Um, they founded their firm, MicroCities. Uh, they're, they're Italians based in Paris, but they also founded the really widely followed uh, website and uh, online magazine, Sock Studio. Uh, I think many of you might know the, know the website already. Uh, there are many different categories. as art, architecture, media, territories. On one hand, it reinforces the typology of these things. On the other hand, they always question the boundaries of these things. I think one thing that really impressed me is this kind of expanded atlas that continues to grow. And it never really serves as the repository of uh, information itself, but always is conductive to design practice. And I think this is something that really impresses me with their work, that they, there's a presence, online a digital presence, but it's, it's, on one hand, it's very similar to the curated exhibition, but it's also different. I think this ha having a very physical and haptic experience is important. I think as a person who had worked on curation of shows, I think having this physicality, uh, conveying information through this physicality is important. So uh, they're also educators. Uh, they teach at uh, Mont La Vallée in Paris, uh, EPFL. They've taught at UIC in Chicago and also the uh, Peach Schwartz Institute in Rotterdam. So on that note, welcome Fosco and Mary Bruna. Uh, thank you, Mark, for this really on point introduction. I thank, of course, Harvard GSD for inviting us and you uh, for attending this lecture. Uh, so, like uh, exactly like um, Mark was uh, was explaining to you, we have a, a double uh, kind of practice. One which is more uh, research oriented, uh, and which has made use of this uh, online platform called Sock Studio. Uh, parallelly, we ran a, a practice, architectural practice called MicroCities. The presentation will be uh, mostly about how these two uh, natures of our work somehow uh, are intertwined uh, together and how they influence one another. And how, in the end, they also can influence our teaching activity and, and, and our curatorial activity as well. Uh, but before we uh, present, we introduce this kind of uh, uh, peculiar work that we do, We'd like to start uh, with um, with one phrase, actually, uh, with uh, the thought of one of our most uh, uh, crucial inspirers, uh, we can say, which is uh, British science fiction author James Graham Ballard. Uh, Ballard misquoted, quoted or misquoted, we're not sure about that, a Salvador Dali's phrase, uh, which was, mind is a state of landscape. Uh, in this phrase, it's condensed uh, both uh, the thought of uh, Salvador Dali, uh, the, uh, which meant to express this uh, double relationship between the inner interior states of minds and the possible expression of an exterior territory, uh, and also the uh, reversal movement of that, which was how the interior states of mind could be, in a way, shaped by uh, by the exterior territory, um, but Ballard introduced another layer, another level to this uh, to this uh, sentence, to this uh, intuition. Uh, he introduced the role of mass media to that uh, to that uh, kind of formula. Uh, mass media the, at the time in 1967, when uh, Ballard gave this interview, uh, were mostly about uh, television 
programs, radio, uh, newspapers, uh, introduced this idea that this, uh, this, mass media, uh, this mass media production was a territory in itself, a territory that was shaping ourselves and that we could shape uh, ourselves uh, inside out. But what about uh, contemporary mass media, what about contemporary territories? We can say that the territory that we uh, roam across, that we explore in each, uh, in each day of our lives, are kind of different to the ones that uh, Valar was uh, exploring at this time. These territories are the ones of uh, blogs, of, of um, text, of YouTube videos, of images, all the cultural production that we uh, come across every day of our lives. In a way, uh, we, since 2006, when we uh, founded SOX, we tried to explore these territories. We tried to uh, be, uh, to some extent, nurtured by them, to understand how they work, uh, and also to uh, apprehend from them how they can be considered as epistemological paradigms of thought production and organization. Uh, we can say that the internet presents two main uh, two main paradigms that we can uh, that we can learn from. Uh, of course, the internet today can be uh, in a way associated to a sort of surrealist uh, experience. Surrealism is the DNA of the internet, according to uh, cultural theorist and uh, artist Kenneth Goldsmith. Uh, we can, to a certain extent, say that uh, the exquisite corpse that Mark was talking about uh, is also, uh, in a way, uh, the, uh, the basis of the uh, production of contemporary uh, media landscape. Uh, the uh, contemporary relation with information is, a, is an exquisite corpse uh, in a way that echo uh, the cadavres as keys produced during the avant-garde times by uh, poets, artists, uh, as varied as uh, André Breton, uh, Max Ernst, uh, uh, etc. Um, Exquisite corps were produced also within the uh, boundary of our discipline. As you may know, uh, uh, Rem Colas with Zaha did, uh, Zengelis uh, produced a series of projects trying to work in this uh, kind of a ludic way to produce a unicum work by the assembling of, uh, of separated activities of each of the participants. But there's a main uh, difference uh, in between these kinds of productions, uh, the avant-gardist ones and the later 1970s and 1980s ones, uh, compared to the perspective of contemporary uh, media production. The difference is that the poetic work today happens as the result of the uh, uh, collaborative enterprise, collaborative work, uh, unconscious work of millions of strangers, uh, working um, by cutting up and assembling texts and videos and, and texts and, and working on the images from all kinds of regions of the world, uh, all kinds of epochs of the world. Uh, and this work is governed by chance, is governed by a, a chaotic way of uh, composing uh, the uh, actual material that is available. Uh, parallelly, we can say that another uh, level of uh, thought organization, of visual information uh, organization and exploration uh, happened, uh, happened to uh, within the realm of the internet. Uh, this one is the Atlas, unfortunately. There's some uh, font problems. But, uh, it's not a problem, you know what we're talking about. Uh, the, the Atlas um, is uh, today the evolution of, from the mythological fear of uh, the primordial titan called, of course, uh, Atlas. Uh, the, after he lost uh, the uh, Titanomachia, the war uh, against the uh, new uh, the, uh, gods of uh, ancient Greece, uh, because he was, he was uh, forced to hold up the celestial spheres uh, upon his shoulders. Uh, this, uh, this figure, uh, of course, became uh, pretty soon the metaphor for a kind of uh, tool of knowledge, uh, the Atlas itself, which was a bidimensional plan uh, that described at first the celestial spheres uh, themselves. Well, it evolved also to describe all kinds 
of visual information. The atlas is uh, not only a, a, script, a descriptor of visual information, but uh, was uh, pretty soon used as a tool, as a form of knowledge, a form of communication, uh, through uh, a collection of images that presented a multiplicity of of, uh, of things in a systematic way uh, through elective affinities. Uh, we have to consider also the, uh, the um, sophistication, the aesthetic sophistication that was attributed to the atlases uh, during the 18, uh, 17, 18, 19th century uh, after the um, scientific revolution. Uh, they associated this form of visual uh, assembling of images uh, to, uh, to a kind of a aesthetic pleasure and, and, and content description. But we have to attend to wait uh, until the early 20th century uh, to, uh, to uh, allow the atlas to be used as a tool for uh, content production and through or, uh, visual organization. And specifically, we have to wait for the work of Abi Warburg, uh, German historian, and his uh, very famous memos in Atlas, by which he, uh, he was able to use the relatively new uh, medium of uh, photography uh, to reproduce a series of works of art from all epochs, especially Renaissance, and to uh, compose new meanings by association, by just opposition, uh, and by uh, the creation so of uh, new uh, themes uh, based upon the, what is permanent in the uh, cultural history uh, of the arts. So in a way, uh, Abi Warburg reinvented the historiography of art. He wasn't interested so much in uh, the chronological aspect of the discipline, uh, but he was more interested in how images could be considered tools to produce new content. In this sense, the Atlas became not only a bi-dimensional descriptor of of a new historiography, but also a territory in itself, uh, a territory in which we could roam across, in which he could move things around. He did something similar in his, in his um, other masterwork, indirect masterwork, which was the production of his own library. Um, Abi Barbu uh, was known also, uh, also for uh, having inherited a huge amount of books that he uh, always uh, spent time reassembling, moving, uh, shifting the position around of. And the vestibule of the bibliotheque of the library by Barbu was also called Mnemosine, or there's an inscription, uh, as you can see in this photograph. Uh, Melmosin uh, was the uh, mother of, uh, of the muses and goddess of memory. So in a way, we can say that memory was already associated, uh, the memorization technique was, uh, was already um, associated by Abi Warburg to imagination. Imagination and memory have a real dependency, uh, one with the other. And more recently, I. French philosopher and historian Georges de Duberman, one of the uh, inheritors of uh, Abi Warburg, uh, thought and practice, tried to uh, to adapt uh, the Mnemosyn Atlas uh, uh, to contemporary times. He tried to update, in particular, one of the plates of the Mnemosyn Atlas uh, um, to uh, contemporary um, production, contemporary uh, media. Uh, you know that uh, the Memo in Atlas as a series was composed as a series of plates, uh, each one with a theme. Uh, Georges de Huberman tried to attempted to uh, update one of these themes, which was the theme of mourning, of pain, uh, for the uh, loss of a relative, for example. So uh, he did that, uh, moving from the aesthetic nature of uh, photography uh, to the uh, motion of films, found footage and cinema. Uh, he did that by projecting these movies, these uh, motion pictures, uh, to the walls of a um, important gallery in Paris, and, and also to the floors, so that people could roam around. So again, this idea of the uh, transversable territory, uh, it was not just an update of uh, the aesthetic nature of the um, images in the Memo um, Atlas, but also an update of this idea of moving around, an extremization of this idea of the Atlas as a, as a specialized uh, device. Uh, atlases are not only related to high culture uh, and to the work of art historians uh, and academia. Uh, atlases are the most ordinary form of uh, thought organization that you could find on the internet again today. Uh, we had all kinds of immaterial atlases uh, through Instagram, uh, through Pinterest, through Tumblrs. 
in a way, we, so we'd like to learn from uh, this uh, double nature of, uh, of the internet, a specialized device, both working in, a, in the sense of a chaotic uh, juxtaposition of work, a, um, governed by chance, and the other one, how a rational uh, organization of thought and content through uh, the visual device of the Atlas is also a spatialized uh, device for producing content. And so starting from this observation of the territories of the internet and specifically how they can produce some method of um, information organization and especially these two poles somehow this uh, the cadaver is a ski on one side and the atlas on the other. Um, we started to ask ourselves how they could um, have an influence on our own practice, how we could learn uh, from them. And as Fosco was already saying, and also Mark in the introduction, we, our practice is a sort of double nature. So on one side we have uh, this website, um, SOCKS, and on the other one, we have this architectural office, MicroCities. And during time, the, their content started to merge. They started to entangle and to influence one another. So in a sense, we would develop some teams of research through the Visual Atlas to the website, which would influence the architectural practice. And on another, we would start to work on some projects, some um, subjects would emerge, and we will treat them through the Atlas itself. Um, I will start by describing SOX. I know some of you know it, but just to give an idea also on how we, um, we developed it. Uh, as I said, SOX is a website, it's a visual atlas, but probably the description which we like the most is this one, uh, which also we feel uh, better uh, um, describes what we are trying to do with, the, with this work. Uh, it's a non-linear journey through distant territories of human imagination. So again, the notion of territory, the idea that um, images could compose a territory, a, territory, uh, a territory through which we wander. And it's non-linear in the sense that there is not a chronological line of thoughts which goes through the website uh, or a specific organization in teams, but you can move from one to another. And also the subject of imagination, which became for us more and more important, which is also the subject of the last, um, the, the last exhibition we did at the Triennale. We started to ask what is imagination, how it's constructed, and what is the relationship in between images and imagination. So we go back to the to, um, mod, uh, kind of organization which are provided by the internet. Uh, this is the way the website is presented in its first page. So it's a magazine somehow, but the articles are very different one another. There is not a real thread. Like every time we choose one subject, um, it's very random. It's maybe something which we encountered. Uh, it's maybe an image we don't know much about and we want to understand better what it is. Um, we give us uh, ourselves a lot of freedom, editorial freedom. And also we are two, and sometimes one writes, sometimes is the other, so we will move from very different um, themes and subjects and also way of uh, showing the content. In this sense, this part of the website learns from the uh, cadavres scheme, learns from the exquisite corpse which is given by the internet, so takes advantage of this possibility. We, uh, we work as, a, um, as the surrealists somehow, so choosing the subjects just uh, because we encounter them. And we can move from one another and they can have no relationship in between uh, them. Um, but Going through time, uh, we opened up a second part of the website uh, with the same content but organized differently and somehow learning from the other uh, knowledge paradigm we talked before, which is present in the internet. So we made out of uh, SOX a visual atlas. Um, so SOX uh, is made by us, we are architects, we are interested in the discipline in itself. Uh, but we are also interested in finding architectural categories into other disciplines. So to see how other disciplines uh, use architectural knowledge somehow. And the different images which are collected in the atlas, uh, they reveal somehow some uh, um, underlying affinities and some specific relationships. And that's how the, um, the part of the atlas 
appears. It somehow learns also from the plates of Nemusin, and it's also an update of it somehow, which takes advantage of the contemporary technology, uh, in the sense that you could enter a, a, um, a tag or a specific word, and this part of the visual atlas will rearrange itself following your uh, research, and it will give you different uh, options. And what was very interesting for us is that uh, we started to do this work with SOX at first as a sort of personal archive. So we were putting inside our own subjects. And during time, we discovered that other people were using uh, the Atlas in a very different way. So they were not seeing in the Atlas the same things which we were seeing. Uh, for example, some uh, professor contacted us saying that he used our Atlas to talk about the relationship in between architecture and the surrealism. And we had never known that we were talking about this, but he had used it in this way. So we realized that the, the content and the plates somehow of this continuously rearranging Atlas uh, could be used and could be worked to extract uh, other kind of knowledge and other subjects. And so that it was somehow escaping ourselves, which we found very interesting. It helped us to construct new relationships. And so we opened a third section of the website, uh, which we call the topics. And in this part of the topics, we, we say that we made a sort of a reverse um, uh, psychoanalysis of our own subjects. Like we didn't decide the topics at first, but some of them, they emerged. They were more important than others. They were recurring and they were always, they were always there. Um, and so we, uh, we decided to make them explicit. And starting from these topics, we entered the relationship in between the topics and uh, the subjects of our work. So, for example, here we have a topic on dysfunctional plants. So, plants which somehow reflect a society, but a society, of course, which is not, uh, let's say, functional. And some other topics were more related to, for example, architectural representation. We have all a part on the meaning of uh, axonometric projection. Or we were also interested in how photography can work uh, to describe a long duration and not a single fragment. And we have other topics, even, for example, form of forms or inner space. They might be considered as topics extracted from the website. And if we move uh, from the, the construction of the atlas and the subject which emerged through this independent research, so a research which also uh, changes shapes during time. Uh, we can give you a few examples of how this works. For example, this is a project uh, we made from some housing in uh, Tampere, in Finland. Uh, it's a series of passive houses. So we were interested in the thickness, which is in between the inner layer of the house and an outer layer. And for thermal reason, what was the distance which we have to give in between the two? And while working on this, we decided to rearrange the whole house in relationship with the differences of temperature. So in the outer part, in this inner skin, which is in between uh, outside and inside, we put those functions, let's say, which uh, those places, those spaces where we would spend less time, and inside those where we would stay more time. So we rearranged the whole structure of the house uh, related to this question of thermal. And one of the topics in socks at the same time became walls as rooms. So at the same time, we were uh, discovering and studying all the projects where, this, uh, where a wall was so extended that it could be inhabited in itself. So it's, it was a sort of uh, going through the project uh, to the atlas and back. And same happened, for example, with this uh, project, which is for a competition for a square in, uh, in Manama, in Bahrain, where at the same time we were working on socks on the topic of fields. So how does it work in isotropic uh, space, uh, which can move in all the different dimensions, which kind of rhythm, which kind of relationship with the boundaries or not. So a very, let's say, direct connection in between the two. Um, but during time, uh, we also made some other, let's say, uh, experiments. 
Uh, this happened really for a chance, and it's very literal and very naive somehow, but um, somebody asked to participate to a collateral event in Venice and to have socks there. So we say, how do we present a digital atlas? And what we did, it, we worked in a Fluxus style, let's say. We produced a deck of playing cards where each card is, a, is an article of the website, and then they can be rearranged by visitors of the exhibition, somehow simulating uh, what we were doing through the atlas, where everyone can somehow rearrange the topics and the relationship in between images. So this was our, the first time where we were asking how the digital uh, uh, territory and the material one can start and communicate. What do we keep? What do we lose? What do we uh, put in between the two? Um, there were other examples. For example, for um, uh, the Orléans Biennale in 2017, we produced this installation, which we call Critic and Landscape, where uh, we extracted some of the subjects of the teams, which were more disciplinary, let's say, from the, from the website, and we translated in a sort of uh, city. Uh, which or landscape or territory which would uh, synthesize all these different subjects. It's about the grid, it's about some kind of structure, about the rooms, about the, um, a room in a room. So all these subjects, they were somehow materialized by these small objects or, or models. Um, but then we had to move, to move on to, to really make this territory, uh, this digital territory, uh, experienceable a little bit, as already Mark uh, was saying, so we were invited by Diogo Seixas Lopez and Andre Tavares to curate the contents of one of the exhibition of the uh, previous Lisbon Architecture Triennale, which was called the, the Form of Form. And um, there was so, a series of pavilion made by three architectural offices, so Johnston, Mark Lee, um, David, uh, David Van Severen and Kersten Gers, from office from Belgium, and uh, Nuno Brandao Costa, and they played this kind of game, also this explicit corpse. Uh, each of them chose three fragments, three spaces from the other practice, plus one of their own, and these spaces were made in, uh, one, in uh, scale one-to-one, -one, uh, but only in, uh, in plasterboard, so not with um, the specific materials, but the form itself was preserved. So it was an exercise also on questioning authorship in a sense, but also reflecting on what stays of the form itself. Um, and we were asked to start from socks, from our atlas, to put the contents into this uh, pavilion, to relate with these forms. Um, so what we did is that we tried to extract a few subjects from, the, um, from socks. And we try to identify in different time periods and regions of the world uh, some analogies and affinities in, in the creation of the built environment uh, made it, to make it possible to highlight what remains constant and what changed specifically for each uh, part. Uh, in the first phase of the um, exhibition, it was supposed to be in the inside of the mat. And this was the very first scheme which we, with which we came, uh, we tried to visualize somehow the different themes which were in our, um, in socks, uh, and imagine how they could be related one another. So how they could become clusters connected one another. And in a second time, this was the plan of the exquisite course by the three architects, so we related mostly to this one. What was very important for us is, so when we ask what do we keep from the digital, what do we lose, what do we gain, uh, one thing which we wanted absolutely to keep is this possibility of entering the atlas from many different points. Uh, when you, uh, you get into socks, you can come in from, let's say, the web, the first page, the, um, the first, um, the home page, yeah. Uh, but also, a lot, most of the people would come in from a specific post, from a link, from somewhere in the internet. And we wanted that in this exhibition there was the same possibility, to get in from not a specific point, but many different, and then to go through it following just the connection from one point to the other. And we start, so this uh, pavilion actually uh, made this possible. You could enter in any place and then just construct uh, your own uh, uh, visit through the images and through the spaces. And also, how did we work with the content in itself? I will just give you one example. 
um, we work with formal and conceptual affinities, making it possible to move from one image to, uh, to another, uh, following this kind of affinities. So we could have, for example, the plan of Kataloyuk, one of the first, uh, let's say, cities somehow in, uh, in the world, uh, which is made by cells, which were always more or less the same dimension. Um, you have no doors, uh, but you would enter from the roof, so everything is connected with the other. We, we could have, for example, the agricultural city by Kishokurokawa, where there is this structure which is superposed to an agricultural field and which has also this vari variation. And for example, we had a series of constructed structure of sculpture taken from the incomplete open cubes by Solewit, uh, which will show this possibility of uh, making a cube um, starting from the different um, uh, sites. And of course, these three uh, uh, works um, at first have not very much in common, but then if you think about uh, variation and repetition, um, you could find, for example, a lot of affinities, and this is what stays in the, in the form. Another, uh, let's say, inspiration for our work, which was very important, is the work by Lucy Lippard, so the um, curator and art uh, theoretist, um, which made this series of exhibition um, in the 70s in the US, and she said that this exhibition could fit uh, in a suitcase, in the sense that the objects didn't have a big value uh, in themselves, material values. They were copies, they were drawings, and they could just be sent everywhere. So we worked with the same spirit somehow. And um, so we produced an exhibition inside this very complex space uh, by the three architects. We decided to make something which was very linear, which helped um, orienting inside the space. So we made an horizon an horizon of images, all of the same site, and then some of the, let's say the sum of these images, they would, um, they would become material, they would become uh, objects, models, and um, sculptures in the middle. So here's just a few images for how it works. And of course you have many doors and windows which connect one space with another, so you can choose your own path somehow through uh, the images and the space. And another layer is that the works which are presented in the space, they respond to the different spaces. They are in relationship, in formal relationship with uh, the specific space. Mm. And so you have, yeah, so you have the, this line, this horizon you can see in the, in the background and in the foreground at the same time. And then uh, starting from this, you will move through the images choosing the affinities. And in a, so. after this first experience, we, we were called again for the Lisbon Architecture Triennale, this time uh, as a curator in a, in a group with uh, as chief curator Eric Lapierre. Um, for a, um, the Lisbon Architecture Triennale, which is now ongoing, it's called the Poetics of Reason. So it asked what are the different ways that reason guides uh, architecture and how it helps to communicate also the discipline itself. And in our case, we produced an exhibition called the Inner Space uh, about the construction of imagination. So how does imagination respond to reason? How does it relate with reason also? And in order to, for this exhibition, we worked as content uh, curators, but also we produced the exhibition design, and we produced this uh, a book, so which is about the is not a catalog, is about the um, the subjects of the exhibition in itself. It expands on the subjects, so it's sort of we move through different media. And to 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 produce this exhibition, we went back to to Ballard, so. What we were talking uh, in the very beginning, it revealed for us again uh, of something which was capable of guiding our thoughts. And uh, what Ballard was saying in his interviews is that he feels that the surrealists created some external landscapes which have a correspondence with their own minds. And especially he feels that you can find the middle ground, which he calls inner space, in between the outer world of reality and on the inner world of the psyche. <coughs> So we decided to try and explore this middle ground, this inner space in between uh, the mind 
and uh, space itself and uh, the outside world. Uh, it's not so easy, but we worked in two parallel ways. On one sense, we try to identify the series of work uh, where, um, um, which were physical representation of inner states of mind of, and especially of imagination. And on the other side, to look for spaces in realities, projects, and also just some uh, uh, and, and works in general, which could work as an extension of inner processes, of um, psychological processes, and specifically with a specific emphasis always on imagination. So that's, uh, we, we see inner space as a starting point of a research, back to what we are doing through SOX and, uh, and microcities. Um, to explain what inner space is, we have to just uh, give a few um, explanations, especially on what we mean with imagination. Uh, we looked a lot, we tried to understand uh, what is imagination uh, from a point of view of cognitive science, and uh, this felt as a very synthetic but also explicit um, um, definition, so by Mark Johnson, cognitive scientist, where he says that imagination is a, our capacity to organize mental representation, precept, image, image schemata, into meaningful uh, unities, and uh, it includes our ability to generate new order. Um, so in the same time, it says that imagination is the capacity of organizing images, so it made sense also to our work with the image and the way of putting it together, of organizing it. And at the same time, it says that it's not an individual, let's say, uh, point of view, uh, it's not fantasy, it's not creativity, it's a very structured human capacity, human ability of putting together uh, things which are first uh, taken through perception, then stored through memory, and then organized through the imagination itself. And another point which was very important for us was that there is nowadays a meeting point in between what the surrealists were saying. Um, so they were showing that there is this middle ground in between imagination and reality, where imagination can be shown as reality. And nowadays, brain uh, physiologists demonstrated that the images of the mind and those of the reality, they are stored in the same part of the brain and, in the same, and they become as real. So spending time dealing with imagination has the same impact on uh, the way we, we relate to things than being into reality. So it is as much important um, as reality. And I will give you a short, let's say, tour through some of the sections of the um, exhibition, which are also some of the sections of the book, uh, what were, which all of them relate also to the work of SOX and Microcities. So our first um, point, which our first um, entrance, let's say, to the exhibition was this idea that imagination is not uh, just something which is in the mind, but it's something which can be experienced, become a sort of territory crossed and inhabited. So we opened with a series of maps uh, in the, really in the exhibition, which are maps of uh, interior process, of inner processes. These are two examples. For example, a map of days by Grayson Paris is, uh, uh, it looks like the depiction of a, zit, a city, but it's actually um, a depiction of the artist himself, his way of thinking, his process. And for example, the map of tender by Francois Chavot is a description of a journey through a lover's art, in a sense, with a lack of indifference or the conquering. So um, the territory as a metaphor works specifically in, in these works. Uh, this is to have a, a better idea of the map of days, which works also a bit very, very literally, but also very clearly explains this concept. Uh, like, yes, every building is a part of the, of the brain, let's say, of, of the experience, the interior experience of the artist. Uh, and then move, we moved through um, architecture and to discover that this metaphor of constructing a territory out of imagination has been widely used in the case of, also in very specific and very well-known works. In the case of the city of the captive blob, of course, the structure of Manhattan with its blocks uh, serves as a way to organizing the images which are in the mind of the architects and also really as a, a device to structure so the imagination. 
And in the case of La Città Analoga by Aldo Rossi, also the different territorial structures which are included are, uh, structure, are taken from the north of Italy or Switzerland, so parts of his own uh, memory and experience and connected to his own imagination in the sense of the images get in his mind, but his own projects too. And we also showed, uh, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, here are some details. Uh, this work from uh, of Lina Bobardi, where she drawn a territory from, of Sicily, and she puts together a series of images which she wanted, which she had in her mind, and she wanted the project to absorb. So it's a method used by the surrealists, but somehow produced by, archi by architects too. And then we move to. Uh, in our research on what imagination is, um, we identified two main uh, also movements, one which is collective uh, and one which is individual. And in the collective one, we refer to the work of um, um, a French philosopher and anthropologist who's called Gilles, Gilbert Durand, um, who works about uh, the anthropological structures of imagination to identify a series of archetypes which are present in uh, many cultures. Um, and which are a way of reading realities which is somehow uh, common to different cultures. Um, also what we wanted to do in this movement from the digital to the material or from the mind to the outside, let's say, uh, is to have a series of uh, figures and a series of form of projects which could embody each of the moment of this exhibition. So we had the map in the first part and we had the cabinet in this part. So on one side, we showed we focused on two main archetypes, the enclosure and the tourist bubble. And on the other side, we showed a series of projects which could refer from one and the other, taken from different epoch of, the, of history and different parts of the world. And in the same section, uh, we, we designed and we construct a cabinet which is a very high structure uh, for an interior exhibition for, of 11 meters, uh, where we referred in the lower part to the studiolo, so this kind of structure which were uh, used by scholars during the Renaissance, where you would have a place to concentrate, but also all the objects referring to your own uh, research. Then it moves up and it gets thinner somehow, but the shelves get larger. And you would find uh, a series of, um, it would refer most to the Wunderkammer, so when this imagination became more uh, physical and uh, collective, so already more people were able to have access to the Wunderkammer or the Cabinet of Curiosities. And up uh, in the uh, highest part, the shelves would become just frames, referring more to the exhibitions and the museums, so where this uh, private culture would become more collective. And, uh, oops. So the, that's what the cabinet, our cabinet looks like. And we, so it's another transposition of the digital research we do through SOX into a physical uh, form. And what also we did is that we only took images which were in a public uh, realm. So just to, to show that also, it's also a discussion on copyright, on what do we have in common, on what can we take from this common culture which is available through the internet. And the whole uh, cabinet uh, talks about uh, the, um, the different uh, aspects which make architecture collective somehow and shareable from representation to color to the relationship with nature to the archetypes, the material culture. And there is a part on the media, somehow from the treaties to, to the internet, let's say. This is the upper part. There was a mezzanine so you could access to the different level. And somehow this part also goes back to the um, reflection on, uh, on, on internet. In, the sense, in this sense, we consider um, the, um, this high possibility of sharing images, which is common today, as a possibility of an imagination becoming collective and shareable. So we want to be critical about it, but we also want to take the, the best out of this condition. Then another part of the, um, of the exhibition was, uh, we call it Architecture as Extended Mind. And it refers to an essay which was produced by Henry Clark and David Chalmers in the 98, which is called The Extended Mind, 
where they demonstrated how cognitive functions do not have only place in the brain, in the physical brain, but also in interaction with the environment, uh, with tools and media, and in the sense also with uh, architecture. Um, so we represented a series of uh, specific architecture and places which could be considered as extension of the inhabitant uh, mind and especially some processes like memorization or imagination or focus. Um, for example, one was the Memory Theater by Giulio Camillo, a polymath from Renaissance, which used the theater of uh, Vitruvio, the model of the Vitruvian theater, uh, to produce a sort of visual encyclopedia of the time. So the Physicals. physical, yes, but also visual mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the time. So the visitor or the user will be in the center. It's a reversed theater. And all the different contents will be on the, on the steps. So this is a representation of how the, the theater would work. We worked with, um, to produce this series of models with students from uh, the Maillard in uh, Rotterdam. We did a studio on the materialization of uh, mental processes. Another representation was also, for example, the studio by Francis Bacon, where his own, uh, all the images he was referring to were scrapped on the, on the floor, or the images taken from medicine magazines, for example, or others, and even the painting. So in the end, there was somehow no distinction in between the painter itself and the space he was uh, using. And of course, the most uh, direct uh, representation, physical representation of this way of thinking is given by uh, Johnson, Sir Johnson House in Lincolnfield in, in London, where there will be a collection of all his memories in the forms of artifacted, but the space itself, um, it's a collection of the special imagination he was, um, he was developing. And the last section I will present to you, uh, it's about individual imagination. So in a sense, we have these common tools, uh, which are parts of the discipline and the media which help spreading the images, but then each one, each architect will find ways uh, or to construct system to organize and externalize his visual uh, universe. Um, we concentrated on a few architects. I will show only one, um, only one kind. We worked with the archive of uh, Aldo Van Eyck not his own archive of projects, but his archive of images. He was collecting images, he was cutting images from magazines, and here you have just some images of the actual binders of the archive, uh, where you can see images from uh, uh, modern art, as well as his, his own uh, pictures or images for Brancusi or Italian towns. And he actually made, also produced, in the case of Van Eyck, we have uh, a real, um, he wrote about this question and he produced this Otterlo circle uh, for, Otterlo, for the Otterlo conference where he actually showed on the left um, what are the references, what are the world which should come together to renovate modern architecture, so the classical, the vernacular and the modern in his case, and on another side an idea of common society. And on the other side, we wanted to show uh, somehow an outcome of this imagination. So one representation of how these uh, images collected together to form imagination uh, can take place into a project. So we, we show the plan of the orphanage of Amsterdam. Uh, but we asked ourselves, how can you show this relationship? How do you show the relationship in between imagination and uh, production? And in this case, uh, Warburg came again uh, helping us, uh, because he made, of course, in his, his library, he had this form. It was a sort of arena. But he also produced this neologism and uh, concept of Denkrau, of space for the thought, space for thinking, uh, which we used as a metaphor to produce a small special device, a small room, which we call the Denkrau, um, which was a, a round room. Uh, which does, with three windows and one uh, small door and entrance and a space to, um, to store and to have some objects inside. And this denkram, which you can see here, would come in relationship with the different images of the materialization of the mental processes, the different models, which are on the left. And, uh, oops. So that's how it, it worked. 
you could come inside um, and it will work also a sort of optical device selecting a part of the images which were outside. So from inside you would have on the, let's say on this desk, uh, some images of the imagination of one architect. This is a case of uh, on Sullivan. And on the outside the window will select the, um, the, the uh, sort of projection of the, of the imagination, which is the project. And here are also some well, on the left for Aldo Van Eyck and on the right for um, Lina Bobardi. So our territory of mind put in relationship with one of our projects. And then uh, when you would look back through the windows from to the door, uh, just in the, in the end of it, you would find it's very small, so I don't know if you can see. Uh, we, um, some students also produce a model um, of um, a work which is somehow which became a sort of symbol for our research, uh, which is the studiolo of uh, San Jerome, as described by Antonello da Messina. And the studiolo in itself, it's an extension of Antonello da Messina brain, uh, with the images of his re own research, of his own uh, values, but at the same time is an actual, uh, an actual space. And what you see here is the representation of the studiolo in the little book we produced. Um, because many times some people asked if we would make socks into a book, and we think that we shouldn't because this would be a way to kill it, because it works bit, because it has this idea of somehow a potential infinity or at least possibility of connection. Uh, but we are not against the book in itself. And so we produce something which can, uh, uh, which makes a sort of constellation. So the Inner Space books talks about the exhibition, talks about socks, about our practice, and also somehow explains how our imagination works. But that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> You spoke, uh, I think, in a very clear way about the nonlinearity of of research and of imagination and the creative process, and somehow the atlas is a is a great device to kind of manifest that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also seems to me like your use of the atlas is also going somewhere, meaning that you are kind of pursuing research questions, and 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 those are somehow relatively clear. And so I was wondering if you could say something about that, about um, research questions and about finding directions, because it also, the kind of fascination with the atlas is also a way to get very lost, right? And so I, I, I see that you guys, I'm just wondering, yeah, like how research questions come into the use of these devices and the embrace of the way the mind works and the creative process develops. Um, yes, it's easy to get lost, of course, uh, but we value uh, this way of getting lost. In a sense, um, the fact is that the Atlas helped us becoming very, um, very open toward the questions. It's not a, an academic device in a sense where everything has to be proven. It allows you this possibility of switching your paths somehow and, and we decided to embrace it, to, to use it as a possibility and that's how the exhibition also, also works. Not everything is explained, uh, some things are just open, are open questions. Yeah. Our intuitions, hypothesis more than uh, actual uh, proven uh, uh, arguments, let's say. Yeah. Um, but maybe uh, you know it's important to to recall the actual process of uh, designing uh, the website. It took uh, years. Actually, the, the website was founded in 2006, and the first was this collection of of, of posts, as, as we said. And then, uh, after about a thousand of articles were written, so after we had this kind of critical mass, we felt maybe the need to structure it in a different way and to produce uh, paths 
across this uh, across this landscape. So in a way, of course, we don't produce um, paths which are uh, more than introductions, let's say, to specific topics. Uh, but uh, each one of these introductions are a valuable, you know, starting point for for everybody, for also for for the audience, uh, to uh, to produce more, um, let's say, thorough explorations of each one of these. So um, in a way. Uh, we also uh, like to refer to one of our uh, teachers in in the school, one uh, important historian that um, always told us that confusion is is important for students to not understand exactly what you're doing. Uh, of course, at the time we thought it was nonsense in a way because we were <laughs> facing you know the exam <laughs> for this professor. But in, in a way, we after maybe a decade we understood how you know confusion and chaos and chance in a way produce knowledge by you know trying your way out of this situation in a way. I have to say they're both educated in Rome. Uh, just a background. <laughs> Austerity. I, so thank you for, for presenting the work. I'm, I'm intrigued by the sort of desire for, or the revelation of your faith in continuity, however. So despite your, your interest in chance and your investment in chance, there are these themes that come about, there are uh, sort of repeated forms, there's a, a faith in certain things that repeat through history, mm -hmm. a belief in history, a belief in, in sort of resonance across offices that can, can talk to each other through the consistency of form. Can you talk about your investment in continuity? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in a sense, this is also, as we were saying, we always have a sort of reverse uh, process like we don't decide to uh, investigate something it it emerges and then we go back to it and that's and so we discovered that these subjects were actually recurring and that they were coming back and they were very much connected to discipline in itself they are very disciplinary teams in a sense when we say it's it's form for example the topic of form or the topic of con some specific kind of construction for example it was um, always coming so it's um, our faith in uh, in continuities because we discovered that there is one and when we were uh, looking for different so working almost with the cadavers key we discovered that some things were just coming back and in this sense we started to extract them and to show them, and we believe uh, also we we believe as we were saying also in the end in this collective sense of the discipline, and we believe that this continuity allow this uh, collective sense allow our own our discussions. They are not just uh, individual forms. They are not individual research, but they com communicate each other and they go back to the roots somehow of the of the discipline in itself. So we embraced it also because we have a sort of, um, we felt very relieved by it in a moment where maybe we were following um, architectural office emerging with a huge concent concentration of becoming original or showing something which was completely disruptive. Uh, we felt uh, very, um, very conf conf yes, we uh, in in this possibility of communication and of continuity. I don't know if I answered. It. <laughs> Just to follow up on the first two questions. I mean, this uh, your work, which I greatly admire, has this perpetual uh, oscillation between intuition and rationale, induction mm. and deduction, and and I, I'm thinking of the like, it follows very much the lineage of uh, uh, Wabi Aberg, but also. Mm. Rossi's scientific autobiography, mm -hmm. uh, Unger's urban morphology, to even Ochati's iconographic uh, autobiography. There's this constant oscillation between the two. Yeah. So do you think it has to do with a certain desire for isomorphism between form that becomes a vehicle of something? The reason is that in recent discussions in the school, there have been issues have been brought up, this revived interest of postmodernism or young generation and Charles Chengs, who died two weeks ago, had always been an advocate of this kind of isomorphism as a vehicle towards semantics and meaning. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think somehow your talk somehow touch upon these undercurrents beyond the uh, formal analogy of postmodernism itself. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. 
Uh, it's uh, it's interesting because you quoted a few architects which are all in the exhibition. There is uh, Oljati, of, yes, that's, but also some works by Ungers, and it's ex exactly on this. So what we show is the somehow behind the curtain process and how after it's rationalized through different uh, methods. And uh, in a sense, we are uh, very, um, can we say, uh, aware of this, um, of this sort of revival of new postmodernism, where we think that images are taken and just recombined together without sometimes uh, a, a deep logic structure in, uh, in form. Uh, but we believe that through our research in imagination, uh, this can be reversed. So all these architects we quote and you quote, uh, they have a multiplicity of sources, a multiplicity of images, but they were always capable of synthesizing. They were always capable of using uh, form, in a sense, also to put all of this uh, together, to make it work um, together. So not keeping just this fascination with fragment, but always going back to uh, rationalizing this process, making it uh, meaningful. And yes, it comes through form, I guess. It resonates with form. Uh, I would add something to this. Uh, on a parallel level, we try to uh, try to inquire on the um, uh, on the social also aspect of this work by this set of architects you were citing, especially the newest one, Oljati, you know, also um, Office from from Belgium. Uh, all these um, a huge amount of these offices, uh, starting from the. A common ground exhibition and try to publicize their own inquiries uh, across the history of the discipline and also history of art, how they were their sources. And we try to understand, and that's actually the main subject of the talks that we're organizing in Lisbon uh, in, uh, in a month, how this uh, public publication of these sources is actually a shared knowledge or is only limited to the autobiographical realm of these architects. We are, we are not sure about this. We think that in the end, um, in the end uh, we can all say that these ventures uh, from contemporary architects is something shareable to a collective level. I think we, we, it stays on a, on a more private realm. But um, this is an open question, and we, we're not sure about this. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> to we asked that to Jacques Lucan, actually, to, to introduce this, this, this problem, this problematic, and to Giovanna Borassi from the CCA to understand how uh, the work of our contemporary archives and contemporary uh, historians like uh, is able to provide you know some kind of linearity in between the, the production of uh, of these architects today and their actually and, and their um, and the possibilities of this work uh, of these collections this musée uh, imaginaire they produce to be something which is actually uh, related to a collective realm more than a public a private venture Um, yes, I really enjoy your work and also as well as your website, but I'm wondering what the relationship might be to a, a person from a different discipline, let's say a business person, a scientist, a lawyer, how they might like perceive this archive or is it meant to be like to just the architects as an audience? Um, yes, thank you. When we um, when we started, um, one of the reasons why we started uh, SOX, why we developed SOX more than started, is that we realized that it was uh, very useful to discuss with students through it. We were working as assistants, and students would would come with the projects, and we wanted to show them some image or reference. We will publish an article and we realized they were reading it, so we were thinking about them, and it made a very special relationship. So at first, we were really among architects and students. And then we discovered that a lot of people from other disciplines were reading. And for example, we know, and it's, I don't know if it's strange or not, but for example, a lot of people who work with video games, they, would, uh, they read socks. So we have a specific uh, answer from that. Lawyers, um, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but surely artists, uh, people interested in video game, media artists, we receive a lot of um, uh, questions or, uh, or other from that. Uh, I don't know if it moves uh, so far from the disciplines. I think you have to at least be interested in a visual uh, culture. It talks a lot through images, even if it goes behind the, the images. 
but in a way, uh, our work is really, um, uh, not so much to talk about or the other disciplines per se, uh, but uh, as one of the sections of the exhibition uh, in, in Lisbon uh, is dedicated to, we didn't present that one in particular, uh, we try always to see how the knowledge, architectural knowledge, is already pres present through the usage of representational tools or even you know, uh, forms of um, visualization and, and so on, or the, uh, the inner thought of architects is present in other disciplines in a way. And so in a way, uh, SOX is filled with uh, content which is not directly uh, related to architecture in a conventional way. You don't find so many, uh, so many built projects, for example, or so many plans of architecture, but it's uh, entirely based upon a disciplinary culture uh, seen also from outside the boundaries of our, of our discipline. So I think it could interest other people because it's about them, but not being completely about them. Hi. Um, I, I wanted, if you can explain um, the work of Abby Warburg in the way that he was doing the boards. Mm -hmm. um, the things were changing place, the things were or growing or getting smaller or moving around. And I'm wondering how you, I know that you talk about tax, but I keep thinking about designing new ways for you to, like, for instance, I don't know if the, the article that has been more read then suddenly, or, or the article that has been clicked together needs to suddenly pair for the next person, because I think um, somehow internet always gives everything in the same size and in the same, and, and suddenly there are things that should enlarge, that is a, a, exactly how our brain works. I don't know if you have thought about mm -hmm. how is this, this way in which each of us maybe needs or, or wants to enlarge something. I was thinking about the first time that I saw, for instance, the presentation of Prezi, you know, that, that way of presenting that you keep mm. dropping the images mm. and some are small, and then suddenly you zoom in a lot, and then suddenly there is a constellation of other things. So how this zoom in and out on, on your, you know, on socks mm. could help also to have things gravitate around the others? I know this sounds super sophisticated right now, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but has this think about you know, because when you have a physical board, you can always like make it a smaller. No? You can move things around. There is n no algorithm that, that does that. It's our mm, focus, uh, th track of thought that that moves things around. And I don't know if you have considered this for or the users or for yourself, for instance. How many times you refer to one image more than other ones? And mm -hmm. I don't know. Just. And no, no, it's, it's a great question because we are always looking for other ways to make it evolve. I mean, sometimes it's just thought because we are not uh, expert. We do everything by ourselves, so we make it very simple. Uh, but we, we would love to, to have other ways to have. We really like this idea of having the same content, which is organized in different ways. And, and this could be a great idea of doing it. So making also the presence of the, of the readers being uh, into it, but we have never done uh, for, ex for the moment. For what we tried to do, it's when we, in the first uh, exhibition in form of form, everything was on the same line, let's say. And because size. And size, much. yes, because also it was a way of relating to this space which was so much uh, changing. In the exhibition that we did uh, in inner space, things were changing, place and materiality and space. So I guess this was more a way of responding to this kind of uh, way of differentiating the content. But it's uh, some of the things which we didn't do through the website. It's just because we never found the time or the mm -hmm. techniques. But we are, we could be open to it. Yeah. Yeah. On the, uh, I agree with that. Um, on the other way around, I think that um, all um, means of uh, uh, presentation of content uh, should be, in a way, within a frame which has to be very clear for the for other people and yourself to, to be able to use the content itself and to, and, and to understand what the content is about. So, uh, and each of the ways of framing the content in a way has its own cultural origin 
and also its own limitations and also constraints. The grid is one way of framing the content. The line on the horizon is a line at 170 because it was at the um, Lisbon Triennial 2016 it was at that height. It couldn't be lower, couldn't be higher because at the same time uh, it's, uh, it, it allows the height to uh, focus on the foreground respect to the background and to check for relationships. So this is another kind of visual device um, to, to produce you know, uh, this kind of uh, contents. So I think that uh, on one hand, the internet would be um, maybe richer to, to, to allow all this kind of, you know, just a position and changing of scales and so on. But still, uh, it depends on the content itself, how you want to, to use it in a way. It cannot be completely free because uh, the uh, technology allows you to do that in a way. Uh, so this, um, I don't know if, you, if we can <laughs> adopt some other kind of framings of uh, content presentation, but each content is not neutral in a way. So, so it, no, of course, mm -hmm. each way of organizing information is not is not neutral, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we are not open to. Other no, sure, ways. sure, no, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you speculate about a collecting terminus. In other words, uh, at the at, at some point, is there a point at which you can say we're done collecting, or at some point does it become normal, or at some point? Have you collected so much that you're buried under it and you, you're just muffled by what you've collected or whatever it might be? Or perhaps there is no terminus. But, but I wonder if you speculate about the, the idea of a, of a terminus, a kind of an end point to the, the collection. Um, recently, like one year ago more or less, we went back to many of the content we had and we took out, uh, I don't know how many Eight articles. Hundred, Yes, uh, yet five, uh, around 500 of contents. So we, we work with that. We didn't stop somehow, but we go back to the content and decide that something cannot be inside. On adding content, I really hope that we will keep doing it when, when we can, in a sense. Uh, because for us, it's really a resource. And it's, we, we give a lot of importance also to this aspect of um, curiosity sometimes. So just put something because we are curious and we want to understand it. We keep this possibility open. And if we decide that it's done, it means that we stopped being uh, curious about things. So it's a pity. I don't know. Maybe I can, uh, okay. sorry, Can I ahead. just, yeah. just yeah. one, a uh, couple of lines. Um, but uh, there's also another uh, paradoxical movement, I think, in, the, in this website, is uh, that uh, on one hand, um, we started doing that because oh, we felt the need to give us constraints in what we were mm. experiencing. So it was actually the other way around. We wanted to limit the number of things that could be uh, important to you know, explore to a certain extent. And also to give uh, uh, also more um, introspection to these kind of things. Of course, we presented a series of, um, let's say, visual atlases, like the many tumblers and Pinterest. At the time that we started, uh, that was starting also, uh, this kind of accumulation of images. We, need, we felt the need to give more uh, structure to that for ourselves. We, we were uh, overwhelmed by the amount, uh, quantity of these images. So we tried to give us constraints. Uh, and this constraint, we wanted to, to keep it and, and go on with this uh, evaluation of what we have, how we can keep working on that and how we can uh, continue doing that. At the same time, uh, I think I said it's paradoxical because the other movement would be to keep a project going on on the internet. Uh, as much as the internet is endless, is over uh, evolving, over uh, changing all the time since the, its beginning, uh, it's very, very difficult to find a project on the internet which is more than, say, five years old. It's very difficult. There, there are not many, apart from newspapers, for example, you know, who are also kind of in a, in a crisis. So um, I think it's, uh, it's important to us to, you know, uh, to, to, to produce a project which is a decade long, which, which can be two decades long. Uh, it, it's, I don't know if it's, uh, I think it has its own importance to, to provide something which is permanent on the internet, which is the realm of impermanence of, um, of evolution all the time. A quick, a quick follow-up. Um, I'm thinking of the way in which speed at the early 20th, during the early 20th century was a kind of obsession for people, trains, planes, cars. Mm -hmm. um, and the way in which speed became normalized at a certain point. We stopped really paying attention to that as a problem or as a subject, say, within 30, 40, 50 years. Um, maybe not entirely. I'm making a kind of simple argument. I wonder if you see the, the, our interest, which is quite heated right now in images, whether or not you see it simply becoming normal. 
um, if, the int if our interest in images is becoming normal? In the same way that Steve, mm. we just we got used to driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour. You can do that with one hand on the wheel or no. <laughs> so is, it, is there an equivalent down the road? I, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly asking you to speculate, of course, but. No, no, I'm thinking. What do you, what do you think happens to images? Do we sort of say, okay, good, it's like putting on a hat? <laughs> I am. Um, it might be at, at the moment, we've been doing this since 2006, so it's already for the internet, as Fosco was saying sometimes. Um, recently, for example, I started to work in second years with students, and we work on, uh, on yeah, Bachelor, we work with, uh, on visual culture, and we start from the image itself. And everybody's saying to the students, like, you work too much with images, you have too many images, and you always use this. And then you discover that the student is not at all educated about images. When you ask to, to find uh, iconography on a specific subject, it comes with nothing, it has nothing. So I guess that for the moment, from what I see, maybe it's a specific audience or something, the work we are doing is still makes sense. Like, uh, there's a lot of images maybe accumulated, but there's not so much about being critical on images, on selecting, on deciding, and this is the work we do. It's not just we present images, we could have done a, a Tumblr or, yes, or just a Pinterest. We, we, we try to look what's behind one image, what it is, where does it come from. So in this sense, I don't feel like we are on a... It's still not normal, in a sense. It's still not uh, given. If it will be in 10 years, I, I cannot say. <laughs> At the moment, I cannot say. Um, thank you. Um, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I, I have a question regarding the the conclusion of the small topics or research uh, that you make. Um, it's interesting that the internet um, has been reframed or framed here um, as it relates to chance. I mean, we know that algorithms has nothing to do with chance. It's sort of like quite curated, maybe not what we used to have, but, but it's hardly chance what's going on um, in there. And, and that's where, where I think it relies the value of what you do, which is a sort of like counter narrative, counter force to that form of organizing knowledge. And you come up with this more, again, a la Warburg, a more driven by subjectivity and sort of like producing new, new narratives. Um, but then I think that the, the trap there is um, you might come through the internet to the same conclusions or narratives that we had before the internet, let's say the classic thing from San Jerome to um, uh, John Stone, it's, it's kind of like a, something that we knew, right? Um, but I wonder if, if in your research or in your topics you've come with surprises, let's say new narratives, new conclusions, new connections that we did not know because we didn't have access to this information, but through some process that you made, all of a sudden, this canon that we thought we knew got a little bit destabilized. That makes sense. Um, yeah, when we say that, yes, we, we say that we are also in bubble, no? that we hear everything that we already want to hear and we keep close into this. And this, this happens especially if we stay in one social network, for example, no? if we keep moving into this. Still, if you keep moving through internet, it's still a very complex experience. Maybe you have to be conscient about it, like taking it as an actual, uh, also aesthetic experience in this sense. So, of course, uh, what we talk about is a more, uh, is a larger experience of the internet itself, but still you would move from one video to one text to one, each one of us, if you think about the journey you do every day to the internet, you've been through in many different places. And uh, this is still like that, even if it's somehow controlled by algorithms or um, um, whatever. And uh, of course we refer to Warburg, we refer to, the, um, to San Jerome, and these are known uh, um, examples. But this is again about this question of permanence. 
So we are interested in saying, okay, uh, we, we talk about internet, there is a lot of fascination for the digital as something which can create something new or original or giving new forms, new, uh, but what we are always interested in is again permanence. So internet is also a way of organizing uh, information which relates to things which have been done before. So as we were answering about the, this question of form, uh, we are more interested in permanence than in uh, disruptions somehow. So that's why also the examples we do are very specific. Then the theater of memory, for example, is a very known, is very known, but it's not that known at the same time. You knew already, Del Minio. You knew it, but for example, for an architectural students, when we presented it, it was completely unknown. And uh, especially if you move specifically to the way it's constructed, but also we have a part on the um, uh, on the palace of memory. It is something which has been uh, very much um, um, studied for everything that is information and organization. It's not that studied sometimes from the point of view of architecture, for example, and form and what form it takes. And Del Mino is one of the few who really cares about form also, because it gives a specific form to this organization of memory, for example. So... Be a specialization mm, of the internet, yeah. in a way. One part of the, of the exhibition is, is also something which is not so common, in a way. Internet is always studied uh, as, exactly as the uh, theater, or, theater of memory, as, as, new, uh, as a kind of paradigm for information content and the accessibility, also spe speed. But it's not so much uh, studied in its own spatial nature uh, as, as in space. Uh, we have two works which are in, uh, in the exhibition, uh, mm -hmm. which are probably newer, which you can, can check, for example, in this sense. Uh, one is by um, a French artist who is called Louise Drule, and she made um, a work on the shape of the internet. So she tried to understand what are the topological reasons in between a series of space you mean in meeting the internet. It's a, it's a work of a few years ago, two years ago. This is maybe less known, and it's always a paradigm of, inform, of organization of information. And another one, it's a video game uh, by Cardboard Computer, um, which is a sort of surreal video game. And uh, it made all the, all the story, it's made with a sort of, um, it looks like a scenography somehow. So it refers to Adolf Appia, for example, but it's also very contemporary. And it's another way of organizing content, which is maybe less uh, known the, than this kind of example. So yes, we came across, actually we came across different, uh, different paradigms of different works which were dealing with this kind of, of uh, discourse. But maybe here we were more interested in showing the direct connection and the... <laughs> of course. Yeah, yes. And coming back just to, as a follow-up to what we were saying uh, in the earlier question, uh, but which relates to what you're uh, uh, asking about algorithms and control of information. In a way, uh, what we do with the image is not just uh, um, some when we teach about reading them to to understand what is behind them to 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 check with a certain rigor uh, their origins, their their own dimensions, also their sizes, the technique they were produced by. Um, this is not just an academic kind of purpose. It's not just to teach the students how to, you know, to, to use an image which is a text exactly as in a text. But it's also can be uh, can also be considered with uh, for its uh, kind of underlying uh, political um, nature uh, to understand uh, a content to to see what's behind it. Also to avoid, you know, um, the the problem of the fake news or, or the information that comes at you. Uh, unverified or unverifiable, um, and to uh, have a critical stance against this kind of uh, access to information, which is, of course, directed through algorithms and, and other, other forms uh, of communication through the internet. So, um, so for us, it's important also to to teach students to how how to you know construct how to use uh, internet in a way which is which is critical. Uh, sure. Hi. Uh, first, I want to mention that I actually graduated from Mandela Valley, so hi. Okay. <laughs> uh, that my question is that uh, when we look at your precedents, uh, like uh, Tumblr and Pinterest, uh, they, have, they have in common that they are collaborative. And like kind of what you mentioned about like the infinity side of the platform and like the, this creative tool and the kind of sustainability in time, 
uh, one of the next steps would be to make it collaborative, like people can come with like content and articles. But uh, I'm just curious, did you have a conversation and why, why, what did you show? Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're already, it's not the first time we get this question asked. I guess it's, this is very difficult. You know, for example, I can imagine uh, exchanging some, adding another part of the structure to select, but uh, making it collaborative will change completely the nature of the work. So I think it would be something else. We could do it, but it would be another another project. At the moment, we are the collaboration is made with the choice of the um, of the subjects. So it's the people we we feature. We feel like we collaborate with them by while showing their work. But in the curation, it would be complicated. It would be yes, it would be another thing, I guess. So. Yeah, it's, it's something similar in a way to the uh, kind of. Um, framing nature that I was talking mm. about earlier in a way this uh, the nature of, of this website this particular website which is of course one of the <laughs> billions of websites that you can find on the internet it, it's uh, it comes from the fact that it's just two people working on, on that and mm. so it's a very limited nature so it's a constraint that we ask ourselves to to pursue uh, but at the same time it's maybe uh, you know the substance of it it's uh, it's, it's its own nature it's its own dimension it would be something completely different and uh, maybe uh, not as rigorous in a way so we we felt like after uh, all these years to continue uh, doing that without changing this kind of particular nature of it thank you, thank you.